if you really want to increase your energy, you can actually biohack your mitochondria so you can have energy like a pro. And today I'm going to show you how. You're watching the Dr. Jake podcast. I'm Dr. Jake. I'm a naturopathic medical doctor and integrative physician in Salt Lake City, Utah. On this channel, I share with you how you can heal your body and get your energy back without any harmful drugs or surgery. Be sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. I recently filmed a podcast with my co-host, Teresa Marie, in which we talked about how the mitochondria is so important for energy production. Make sure you stick around till the end because we're going to talk about specific nutrients we need to really get that mitochondria supercharged. It really dives into the mitochondria is where our body and our cells actually make that energy production. We have many things like calories, proteins, fat, sugars, hormones, whatever. These are all things that are needed for the mitochondria to work or to stimulate the mitochondria. But all energy is coming from ATP, which is made inside our mitochondria. So let's dive into really like what is the mitochondria? What's so important of it? I'm sure you learned about it way back in biology class somewhere. So we're going to go way back and start learning about the mitochondria. Don't worry, I'm not really going to dive into it in great detail to make you get really bored here. I'm just going to brush over it real quick. But to kind of get an understanding is our body makes tons, at least a healthy individual makes tons ATP every day. We actually make our body weight worth of ATP each day. And then when we exercise, we're increasing that by 0.5 to 1 kilograms per minute of the amount of ATP production that we are making. And what's interesting about it is we don't store this ATP at all. Our cells need to continue to make it all the time. Our body's going to use it or it's just going to eliminate it. So it's not like, okay, I'm working on my mitochondria. I'm healing my mitochondria. I've done it really well. I've done, I've been taking my supplements or whatever i've been living a good diet to stimulate my mitochondria function but i just decided that i'm going to stop for a little bit guess what you're not going to have good energy production because you're not making the atp well again so let's dive into how do we actually make that energy production how do we make that atp molecule so i'm going to talk about three different steps of action that we go to so we start out with something called the pyruvate cycle so this goes through several different steps and it's either going to be shuttled over to lactate or then it's going to be stay pyruvate and actually go inside the cell and stimulate something called the krebs cycle now we're going to dive into some of the really important things here it goes through so many different steps and it's all needed dependent upon a certain vitamin or mineral or certain nutrient to go to each step throughout the process and we make like 90 percent of our atp production in this specific step so let's say we're deficient of a certain vitamin or mineral it's going to affect a great deal of how much atp that we're making which is what our cells use for energy production throughout the entire body so it goes to the krebs cycle and then it needs to, and the Krebs cycle produces all these highly electro, uh, energized electrons that are needed for the electron transport chain. And this is the final step that we have in the ATP production. And it goes through several different mechanisms of action, need all kinds of different nutrients to be able to function appropriately. Now, I'm, I'm wondering about this. Like, if we are making enough ATP for optimal performance, we not only should have a body that's functioning well, but we should also feel feel energized, right? If we're low, what does the body prioritize? I'm assuming that the body would prioritize the ATP for vital functions and not for general senses of energy and well-being. Am I correct on that? You are exactly right. So let's say you aren't very well or your mitochondria has been damaged or you have a nutrient deficiency leading to your mitochondria not working very well. Yeah, you're not going to feel very energized. Your brain's not going to work as well. It's going to go to certain organs that we have to work for us to be able to live. It's going to give some of that to our kidneys and to our GI tracts and to our heart. So, and it's going to make our brain function, but not optimally and we're not going we're not going to feel like we have a great deal of focus and concentration and remembering things very well when our mitochondria aren't working like they should so yeah you're exactly right there and then i would imagine then even going worse if our mitochondria is not working even at suboptimal levels that are needed for the vital functions of our body so now we're not feeling we're feeling tired we're feeling you know all of the the the, the feeling you know sensory sensations of having low energy 
but then now we're not getting enough of the mitochondria to actually support our kidneys, support all of these healthy, you know, mechanisms of our body. What type of damages might we see happening? I mean, are we talking like autoimmune conditions? Are we talking cancer? Like what could happen if the mitochondria is not even doing well enough to help our, our, our organs? So, yeah. So if we get to this point that we have that much damage to our mitochondria, we're going to get all kinds of chronic disease. And if you think of majority degenerative diseases, which are a lot of the chronic diseases that we have, they're all related to mitochondrial trauma. So like you could start experiencing Parkinson-like symptoms, uh, which is the, the tremors or not being able to walk appropriately, or you might have some memory issues that come along with Parkinson's. You might get Alzheimer's or dementia. That's very common. So a lot of brain stuff. The reason for that is because 70% of our mitochondrial function is, is in our brain. So 70% of our ATP production is in our brain. So if you have trauma to that mitochondrial function, you're going to have all kinds of symptoms that are related to neurological stuff. But also this will lead to chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia. It can lead to kidney diseases like you were talking about, cardiovascular disease, like atrial fibrillation or atherosclerosis, which is thinning, uh, blocking of the arteries. So a lot of the chronic diseases we think about are related to mitochondria. That's what's so important about it. So it's it's great for energy production, make you feel awesome, but it's also needed for you just to be really healthy and prevent all these horrible diseases that can happen. Which explains to me, like being part of the cancer community with my husband having cancer, we definitely have seen this interesting correlation in, in the language and what people are talking about in high performance athletes and in like the cancer community. It's like, they have they're on two opposite sides of the spectrum when it comes to like what they're trying to achieve but it, they're actually having to use the same mechanisms in order to achieve it so you know the cancer community is wanting to like obviously heal their cancer and in in this particular topic part of that is healing their mitochondria so that their body can stop making cancer and you know the disease that it's that's it making and then for those high performance athletes who don't necessarily have cancer their body's working fine they're wanting to optimize their mitochondria because they want to be able to do more of the things that they want to do whether it's athletic performance or even we have these like high performance entrepreneurs who i mean just have so much that they're in charge of and they want to have these like long days and be able to just like slam out stuff they're interested in this topic too so it, it's interesting to see this this crossover on both, but obviously any of us in the middle uh, can benefit, uh, I think, from this knowledge too, just so that we can feel better and stay healthy, right? Like actually maintain our health because the little teeny poor choices that we're making now could eventually lead to the mitochondrial damage that could cause cancer in the future or Parkinson's like you're bringing up. And then of course, you know, if we want to just, hey, I'm feeling a little low recently. I'm not really sure why my energy levels are low. Um, knowing how to improve it, I think is really, really awesome. So you just talked about the different steps that the mitochondria go through in order to create energy for us. What could cause damage to it so that it's not going through this, this cycle in a complete and healthy way? Yeah, this is very important. There's so many different things that can cause damage to our mitochondria. And then this is why it's so common that people have this mitochondrial damage. And I think a lot of people think it's common, not necessarily ideal, that people are tired or they're tired during certain times of the day or they're not thinking as well. Or it's normal to just not have as much energy or be able to exercise as well as we age. The reason for that is all our mitochondria are not working very well. So the aging process is one thing that does damage our, our uh, mitochondrial function is that's because of the oxidative stress that happens. But there's many things that we can do to decrease that aging process that happens. But also what causes damage to it is many pollutants. So we have organic solvents. We have herbicides and pesticides. We have certain GMO products. We have just things that we spray on our lawn. All these type of things get into our bloodstream and damage our cells and damage our mitochondrial function. So we need to try to eat as clean as we can. Don't put as much gunk on our bodies. Try to put just natural things on our bodies because a lot of these things are going to cause damage to our mitochondrial function. There's also many drugs. And these are drugs that a lot of people take when they get older or because one is statins. That's a very common medication that's given 
from, like from heart doctors conditions, right? patients. This is needed for heart conditions to decrease cholesterol levels, right? When you age, a lot of people get high cholesterol. Many times, yeah, your cholesterol is going high, but it's definitely related to diet. But they give you a statin. And that just is so hard on our mitochondrial function. Big thing that it depletes is CoQ10. That's why you can not get the joint aches that many people do with statins. You give them CoQ10. But that's not going to be the only thing you need. To, that's not going to heal all your mitochondria. But statins is a big problem there. Antibiotics, very common. They do kill the bacteria, but also they damage many of the mechanisms of action inside our cells. So many antibiotics are a problem. And guess what? This is probably not going to be very happy to a lot of people either for hearing this is that NSAIDs or acetaminophen, which is Tylenol. Mm. These things are very hard on our mitochondrial function too. So let's say you just take it for a little bit, for a little bit of ache and pain for three days. Mitochondria is going to recruit pretty well after doing that. But let's say you're taking it all the time for arthritis, for example, or some other pain you have or chronic headaches, you're really messing with your mitochondria. It's going to lead to all kinds of problems in the future. So, I mean, it's amazing. It seems like, you know, here are these three things that we are told by doctors, you know, that, you know, are, are helpful to us if we're not doing well. And, and I imagine in, in, in certain situations, you know, they might be necessary, right? And you have to kind of weigh the, the risks depending on how serious the situation is, right? Like there is risk with it and we need to really look at, okay, is it worth the risk in this particular situation? And what alternatives do we have so that we can resolve the problem that we're having without damaging our mitochondria in the first place. So looking at alternatives to antibiotics, if possible, right? Looking for alternatives to statins. How can, how can you lower your bad cholesterol in a healthy way and it, rather than hurting even your good cholesterol that we need for vital functions, right? And so forth. I know that that's something that we can dig into on future episodes. And we have talked about some of these. Like we do have an episode that we talked about with, you know, natural natural forms of antibiotics that you can take that don't mess, you know, up your mitochondria and things like that. Um, so for those of you who are interested in that, you know, take a look at some of the other content that we have where we really dig into it. Now, as far as what you're talking about with staying away, obviously we're going to need to stay away or minimize our exposure to some of these things that damage our mitochondria. For those of us who want to do that, how do we then know like that's reducing the damage, but how do we then heal? How do we then get our mitochondria act to actually performing where it should be or even better than where it should be so that we can reach our goals, whether that's fighting cancer or running that marathon? What are your tips? So yeah, I'm sure many of you are listening here and be like, yeah, I've taken antibiotics. I'm on a statin right now, or I've definitely taken anti-inflammatories. So if you've taken these things long-term, you've definitely damaged your mitochondria. Maybe you're doing things that are really healthy and maybe your mitochondria is healthy, but probably your mitochondria has been damaged and is still staying damaged. It's not optimized and working as well as it should. So what can we do to actually get that mitochondria healed up? Many things that we need are some of the nutrients that the mitochondria uses a great deal. Some of these are many of our B vitamins, especially riboflavin and niacin. Those are the most important B vitamins that we have to really stimulate our mitochondrial function. We also need to be thinking about getting CoQ10. I talked about that related to the uh, mitochondrial function with statins. CoQ10 is very important with the before step, pyruvic getting in there. Also, most importantly, it's involved in the electron transport chain. We also need carnitine to be able to transfer those fatty acids appropriately right into our mitochondria to be able to function appropriately. But also we need to take some things to help decrease some of this oxidative stress, which is this oxygen damage that happens to the body or this damage that's happening from all these pollutants or medications or whatever, is taking great antioxidants. And my favorite one is glutathione. A ton of research on glutathione on how it helps our mitochondrial function improving its function and also cleaning out all the gunk that's throughout the body. So that's really good. Alpha lipoic acid is really awesome for that too. You know, two things that I think of when I'm hearing what you're saying, I actually just got over uh, what I, 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 I'm pretty, pretty confident is uh, my second round of um, the vid much easier than the first time. Like I, it's been like almost two years since the first time. So it was like pretty much a cold. It was really not a big deal. But one of the things I noticed afterward was I felt like I would say t fatigue was the, the worst symptom out of all of it. It was just really like a lingering fatigue. Uh, and I started thinking about our conversations that you and I have had about mitochondria 
And so it started taking some of these vitamins that these nutrients that you're talking about right now and noticed a huge difference um, just with my energy levels. So I know that sometimes even viruses can affect our mitochondria and sometimes even just getting over the lingering effects. This can be really beneficial. Another thing that I was thinking about is you were talking about the aging process earlier and how the aging process is part of what what causes us to, you know, have our mitochondria stop, you know, start underperforming. And here you are now talking about nutrients. One of the things that I've learned is that with age, our, our pancreas doesn't always produce as much pancreatic enzymes as we once had when we were younger. And that plays a really vital role in us even absorbing the nutrients. So a lot of these vitamins that you're talking about, I imagine some of these are in the food that we eat. But if, if our digestive juices are not actually breaking down the food that we eat to absorb these nutrients, I could see how that could create a vicious cycle on our aging process, affect our mitochondria. And this is like part of what gets us older, right? And not feeling good as we get older. So, I mean, my question to you, my long-winded um, story is taking pancreatic enzymes, uh, digestive enzymes, would you recommend that as, as a, a tool in helping us be able to get the nutrients that we need to help our mitochondria. It can be very important if you are not producing enough digestive enzymes. And most importantly, as we age, we decrease something called hydrochloric acid. And that really inhibits a lot of the nutrients we're able to absorb when we decrease that hydrochloric acid production. So taking hydrochloric acid with pancreatic enzymes can be really important, especially as you age. But let's say you have some gut issues going on, you definitely need to start, start taking some enzymes to improve your uh, digestion because you're going to have a lot of issues if if you don't uh, because you're not going to, you're not going to have the HCL pancreatic enzymes and then you have all this poor absorption that's happening because of the inflammation or mucus uh, production inside the gut causing you not to be able to absorb your nutrients very well and the digestive enzymes will help you there but yeah so it depends on what's going on I don't say everyone needs to be taking pancreatic enzymes to heal their mitochondria it all depends on what's going on if you need to take it or not. I really like you talking about the bugs. I didn't really talk about this in great detail here at all, but viruses or bacteria or funguses, these are big causes of mitochondrial trauma too. And I see this all the time and I'm always ruling this out when patients are presenting with symptoms. I'm like, hey, you got some mitochondrial stuff going on. We need to rule out chronic infections or certain acute infections that you've been exposed to that may have damaged your mitochondria and you just really haven't been better ever since. You know, and we actually have a couple of episodes on that where, I mean, Dr. Jake really digs into some of the biggest chronic infections from viruses and bacteria that he sees in his office all the time, what it does to your body and what he does to actually help you get rid of it. So make sure and take a look at some of those um, other past episodes. I think they'll be really, really helpful for you. Dr. Jake, as far as these nutrients that you're talking about here to help our mitochondria and our energy levels, what kind of foods can we find some of these in um, if we wanted to get some of this through our, our diet? I know that we're going to dig into another episode um, where we're going to really get into like a, what a healthy diet looks like. But, but you know, where, where do we find B vitamins? Where do we find CoQ10? Things like that. Yeah. So a lot of these things are going to be coming from our animal products. So if you are vegan, you need to be supplementing uh, with these B vitamins or CoQ10 and things like that, because a lot of it is coming from our meat and eggs and dairy products. Also, a lot of us have poor oxygen delivery into our cells. This could be because we have atherosclerosis and our arteries get narrowed and our capillaries get narrowed and don't deliver the oxygen very well. Could be that we're chronically inflamed, causing inflammation of our blood vessels leading to poor delivery of oxygen, making the red blood cells not get in there very well. So we need to make sure we get good oxygen. And that's going to be happening through good exercise or breathing routines. But if you have all this chronic inflammatory response or atherosclerosis, the really important thing is you need to be doing something like hyperbaric oxygen therapy to really get that mitochondria healed up and get that oxygen back into your cells. And that's something we do also in my office. So that's the main source of a lot of our mitochondria healing can come from that. Also, I didn't say something about magnesium. Magnesium is extremely important for mitochondrial function too. And the main place we're getting that is from our veggies, especially our leafy greens. So you need to have a good, well-balanced diet. I'm not saying you need to go on a carnivore diet or you 
need to eat just tons of meat. That's not what I'm saying, but you need to probably get a little bit of meat in there to be able to maintain a good mitochondrial function because you're going to be deficient of these certain B vitamins. Now, nuts and seeds have a little bit in there, but not close to as much as what we get from our uh, animal products. If you really want to learn more about mitochondria and other ways to increase your energy production, click the video to the right. I'm Dr. Jake, and I'll see you there.